What is going on, you beautiful bastards? Welcome back to the channel. I am Brandon Sylvia. This is Unnecessary Rambling. Please consider subscribing if you enjoy the content. All right, so let's dive into what I am playing or what I have been playing over the last couple weeks. I finished Saints Row, you know, my little run through the Saints Row games, played one, two, and got out of hell. And I wanted to, after finishing that, kind of dive into some shorter experiences, games I could get through in a day or two. So I did just that, and I played quite a few of them that I can get through in a day or two. So we have a lot to talk about here, so we're not going to spend too long diving into each one, but everything will be listed down below in the timestamps for you to sift through. But I think we got to start it off, you know, where we're diving in to spooktober it's the spooky season so we'll, we'll sprinkle in a little bit of humorous spooky action character action if you will De probably could have figured out some some better uh some better verbiage there but we're talking about bayonetta 2 let's dive into that at the top of the video i played bayonetta 1 for the first time last year loved it needed to dive into 2 before checking out Bayonetta 3, dropping later this month, so I had to finish up too, and I did. Quick, you know, nice little eight-hour game, get through it in two sittings, and I love it. Of course, I love it. It's just as good as the first game, and better in many instances. I like the story a lot more in the first game, and I still think I there's a lot of lore that I need to, like, read a summary of or read kind of like a deeper dive into the lore to, to uncover all the connective tissue between one and two and the characters and how they tie into what's going on with three and like just you know one of those uh whatever they call it everything you need to know before playing bayonetta three style videos i need to dive into one of those before jumping into three because i was still left a little bit confused with the story in bayonetta two Whereas with one, I thought it was fairly straightforward enough and easy to understand. Like the little kid that pops up in Bayonetta 2, I have no idea what that fucker is doing. I don't have any clue what Origins is. You know, I, I, I don't I, I don't know. I really have no idea. I, I know that there was a revelation at the end, but I it, still pretty confused on that character's arc. But nonetheless, the, the reason you dive into Bayonetta, or at least the reason I dive into Bayonetta is the flashy, eccentric, over-the-top action that you get in that game. It's so damn fun to play. It's so fun to, to you know, kind of upgrade and pick the different abilities for your character and have Bayonetta pulling off spinner roonies and then in, in Bayonetta 2, they have you, like, shape-shifting into a snake, whereas, you know, in, in 1, you can kind of run around as the panther or whatever, doing some platforming and shit. Bayonetta 2, you're, you're shape-shifting into a snake in those underwater sequences and having to, to, you know, swiftly move around underwater as a snake. And it's just like, they're always adding these nice little additions to keep the gameplay moving, keep it flowing, keep it fresh, like in Bayonetta 3. They have the the spider, the machine spider, mech spider thing that you're turning into. And, and, you know, obviously the new character with Viola and all that. But it's like Platinum just, they continuously throw shit at the wall. And, you know, just see what's going to stick there. And then I love that idea of just like, you, you know, here, you're, you're a damn snake now. Here, you're a panther now. Here, you're a damn machine uh, mech spider creature. Like... I just love that. Give me, I, I, I don't always need, you know, super deep connective tissue for every single mechanic in a video game. At the end of the day, it is just a video game. And sometimes it's okay to just be a video gamey ass video game. I'm not going to dive, you know, super deep into pulling apart every little mechanic and figuring out why that shouldn't work for story reasons or why that shouldn't work for lore reasons. Just give me some fun shit to mess around with. You know, it's a character action game. Let's have some fun. Let's hack and slash. Let's pull off some crazy combos and, and you know, do the Booker T spin a Rooney shooting people with our heels and turning into a, a, a damn crow mid battle. And, and, and it's just epic on a scale that is unlike really anything else in that realm i know the early god of war games had an epicness and a scale that that 
was unheard of for that time, you know, kind of coming off the Devil May Cry era. But Bayonetta just, it, especially Bayonetta 2, Bayonetta 1 was huge and, and it was definitely epic in a similar regard, but Bayonetta 2 just was so much bigger. Like, even when you get into some of the levels and how open and expansive they are, and then, you know, just that immediate, like, as soon as you pick up the game, that first hour, it it's a crazy, crazy scale that that big ass boss battle right out the gates, and then closing off the game, you have the um, you know where where you're turning into a, a mech, and at the very end of the game, you're turning into a jet fighter and shit. It's just a bad ass nonstop boss rush for the majority of the game and the monster design and the set dressing it's just all so good and it's all encapsulated with this incredible moment to moment just incredible incredible moment to moment action and it's just really damn fun i i don't have a ton of insightful in-depth analysis to add here to bayonetta 2 comparing and contrasting it to one it's it's just a lot more of that just feels so damn good and i'm okay with having a lot more of that with the introduction of more you know a couple new features like the little snake and then the the just more grandiose boss rush encounters that you're given one after another so absolutely freaking loved it cannot wait to dive into bayonetta 3 all right next up let's talk about little orpheus this is a game that i played for like 30 minutes on my iphone a while back because i just heard such great things about it a limbo like if you will a 2d sort of adventure platformer puzzle solver style of game and i i really was blown away by the visuals as soon as i booted it up on my phone but i was just like ah, do i really want to freaking play something on my phone I, i'll just wait you know i'll just wait and finally came to consoles i think it's like freaking 15 dollars or something super super cheap so i picked it up and dove in just based off of the critical acclaim that it got and it's a good game it's just it's very very simple it's you know, like I said, it's in that vein of your limbos and insides and little nightmares, but there's just no difficulty at all. It's real easy to get through in one sitting if you want to. And it's just, it's like those games, but it's much more reliant on the writing, the story and the visuals more than it's kind of, it's just not focused on challenging you at all. And like I said, you're you're not going to really run up against anything throughout your runtime with this game that's gonna like make you scratch your head or figure out how to solve this puzzle. Like you might run into a roadblock here for like a second. Like there was one where it was just 100% my fault. It was like a very simple environmental clue that I just didn't pick up on. It took me, you know, maybe five minutes. And it's like, oh, okay, obviously, dumbass. It's right there, kind of as obvious as it can get that you need to do this one thing and then you're not doing it because you're being stubborn. And, and as soon as you take a step back, it's easy as hell to kind of realize any of your errors that you're making. But for the most part, it's just telling you a simple, fun little story. And, and I, I would say the narrative is pretty damn strong overall. You're playing as this uh, what the hell do they call them? It, like an astronaut, a Russian astronaut. I forget the the uh, cosmonaut, I, I believe, or something, something not. I don't know what the hell the Russians call it. But you're you're playing as essentially an astronaut, and you are claiming to your general that you saved the world, but in the process you lost this atomic bomb. So you're kind of reliving these flashback sequences where. You're experiencing uh, your character saving the world and you'll have these kind of cutbacks to the real time interrogation that's taking place between you and your general and the general will be like scolding you and, and uh, kind of questioning your story and, and just the, the dialogue between the two of them is really well written and well performed. And so it, that's kind of what carries you through 
the entire game. There's not really a ton to, to dive into with the gameplay. Like I said, it is just your 2D side-scrolling puzzle-solving adventure game, and it's just sort of a, a, a vehicle or a, a vessel to, to get you through into the next story encounter and to experience some awesome ass visuals. The visuals across the board are, are for sure uh, the standout of the game. I would say it's incredible use of, of different colors and color combinations and just real, real good environmental work. Like, the there's one level where you're walking across these platforms and you're stepping on these squishy objects and as you're kind of distributing your weight from left to right foot the object or the platform up underneath you is responding and it's like you're squishing down on it and it looks like it's almost breathing as you're you know uh, going from your left to right foot and then the environment's responding in real time it's just great little attention to detail like that and great level diversity throughout uh, throughout the game you're experiencing all these different crazy settings where one at the beginning of the game you're like going up against a dinosaur and throughout the game it's just these over the top scenarios that you're being put in front of and you have like super you know the these snowy locations and and almost like an Uncharted 3-esque desert location a little bit later on in the game. Just just real good level design across the board. Fun game. It's nothing that's going to knock your socks off in any one way like other than the visuals. I would say everything else is just pretty okay. Nice little ending to the story, but nothing that's subverting your expectations to some, you know, huge degree or anything. Just an overall good game good story, great visuals, and, and pretty like generic, okay, just, just okay gameplay. I would say it's like a, a solid C range game, nothing special, but fun to, to dabble with for a day. If you have four hours to kill. And next we are diving into another game pass hidden gym game Pass is constantly cranking out some Indie Darlings Day One drops and Proteus is absolutely one that I enjoyed the hell out of. Another quick experience, get through it in about five, six hours. First person shooter, old school Doom inspired first person shooter. And, it, you know, it's keeping true to that old school Doom style of visuals and aesthetic, but it's just a gory romp man you're you're going through and you like th there's sections where you will litter an entire environment in the blood of your enemies and it really does look like you just took a red can of paint and and sprayed it across the environment it's like the entire damn location will be stained with the enemy's blood and it's so goddamn fun to just swap between the different weapons and you're constantly having to swap between these different weapons because you're running out of ammo for one, you get real used to one, you run out of ammo, you swap to another and you just get real familiar with all the different weapons that you're swapping in and out of and the levels are mostly for for uh, the most part nice, tight and linear. There are a couple in the later stages that are a little bit rough because the map isn't all that great and you'll get to those later parts and and you're like oh man th this is really hurting the game because of the the openness that you're experiencing here because you're trying to to figure out where to go and you know you might die and get respawned at a checkpoint and you're like okay well was i over here was i over there you pull up the map and it's like well that's not really helping me whatsoever but for the most part i would say like 80 percent of the game until the very late stages of the game everything's just simple straight to the point super linear each level is going to take you around like 20 minutes and th there's actually once again a lot of level diversity here you're, you're going through a bunch of different stages that all have different you know set pieces for you to explore and different cool shit for you to do and the the real late stage levels has one of my favorite settings for uh, 2022 so far this year it's like this cathedral and you you're like in this almost old gothic style church setting and you're having to shoot 
at this bell and there's like a little maze section that you're it, it's not overly intrusive or anything but you can kind of get lost in it and have to backtrack a little bit it, it's blending a slight old school survival horror elements with you know um a, a more linear first person old school doom inspired title so it's just a cool little mix there to to add to the variety the different monsters that you're facing throughout the game are, are sick well designed although it definitely limited you're not having a ton of different enemy types to engage with throughout the game but you know it's a much smaller indie title but they, there are like the, this cool ass monster that's shooting these laser discs at you and you're having to dodge to the left dodge to the right and then you have you know the big old tank dudes who come in with the gatling guns and they're trying to mow you down but you don't really have any like epic kind of bosses to encounter there are more powerful enemies throughout the game like i said the those two that i mentioned there and a couple other like flying enemies but it's all just more about a quick fast moving kill fest that you're getting to experience and it's not overly hard the the last level of the game is very very challenging but other than that you're you're going to get through it with no real problems the checkpoint systems are great so you're going to die pretty frequently or at least i died pretty frequently but you get rebooted right back to where you were get back in battle pretty quickly like i said the only time it becomes a hindrance is when you're restarted at a checkpoint you're like oh shit i made a little bit more progress than this and i'm not exactly sure how i got here so you're pulling out the map trying to reconfigure refigure out how to you know get to where you you last left off some of that can be a little bit detrimental to the the more straightforward linear design of the game and when it is pushing you forward at a great pace and you have that metal chugging soundtrack in your ear and it just feels so damn it, it just feels so rewarding and fun and so having the 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 map not be the greatest and then trying to figure out you know if you got lost try to figure out how to get back on track that can be to the detriment of overall a very tight structured game so that that would be my only real complaint other than the lack of enemy variety but that i can kind of forgive because it is a much much smaller title all right and next let's dive into the greatest resident evil game of all time resident evil 6 absolutely hands down the best resident evil game of all time i don't think there's really any debate about that just critically acclaimed beloved by pretty much everybody and yeah i went back to the greatest resident evil game of all time resident evil 6 and i played through leon's campaign because i just wanted to play through leon's campaign for re6 and i enjoy it i enjoy it it i played through re6 and then you know all joking aside obviously joking there i hope people caught that Let, let's assume people caught that um but yeah i played through the leon's campaign or i played through resident evil 6 initially on the ps3 with my buddy and we loved the game we played through the whole thing had a real damn good time with it i had my complaints with it for sure i'm an old school resident evil fan my favorite games in the resident evil series are you know the the old school tank controlled tank based control games i, I like that format more for resident evil it was just what i grew up on so i i have such nostalgia for that so you know moving into re4 re5 re6 there was something that, that was lost in that transition but i loved re4 so much so i was able to embrace it and i always like seeing capcom do new things with resident evil and i definitely feel that way with resident evil 6 you know it, it was very very different but I felt like it was the first time they really embraced being that different. Resident Evil 4 was a huge departure. Resident Evil 5 was an even greater departure. And Resident Evil 6 really felt like it just ripped the band-aid off of being survival horror. And just went into something totally different. A Michael Bay film with this huge, like, huge movie-style budget. This huge cinematic-style experience. And I just kind of appreciated the the uniqueness that came with all of that. And I always really did enjoy Leon's campaign for kind of being, I'm not going to say grounded, 
because God knows it's not grounded as you're, you know, commandeering fucking uh, airplanes and helicopters and Leon's just piloting you through the sky as if you're fucking, uh, uh, you know, playing damn Starhawk or, or playing damn um, Crimson Skies or, or Microsoft Flight Sim or some shit. Leon's just out there piloting his ass off. But I don't know. I appreciated some of the zaniness that came with all that because it was just. I was just like, okay, this is fun. This is really different. It's really fun. And going back to it, there were a couple things that I forgot how, or maybe it's just aged so poorly, especially when compared to something like the RE2 and RE3 remake, where it, one thing before we get into the negatives, I will say huge positive is that this, well, I guess Revelations would have been the first time you were able to, in that vein of the the over-the-shoulder kind of perspective, being able to, you know, m move and shoot, aim and sh aim and move. And, like, I know that Outbreak File 2 would have technically been the first time you were, to, you were able to aim and move, but that was still more in the tank-based vein. Whereas, I believe Re Revelations 1 was the first time you were actually able to aim and move in that more over the shoulder style perspective. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but RE6 was, I, I'm, I'm almost positive. I, I, I'm pretty positive. The first game in the mainline series where you were, where you were able, where you were able to aim and move in that over the shoulder style perspective. So I, I definitely appreciate that aspect, but Going back to, to, you know, RE6 after playing RE2, RE3, you're like, holy shit, there's a lot that, that they improved on with this formula over time, as they should, of course. You're talking about almost a decade of experience working in that fashion and, you know, coming up with the improvements, running in the RE engine, having the, you know, new next-gen technology and, and, you know, having the limb dismemberment and all that shit, but... There is just a feeling going back to RE6 where you're like, holy shit, this is just Gears of War with a Resident Evil skin on it. Like, it, it you know, so many times throughout Leon's campaign, and I always remembered Leon's campaign being the more grounded campaign in RE6 other than Adis, but I, I always remembered Leon's campaign feeling a little bit more survival horror-like. And then I'm going back to it, and there's so many sections where the only objective is just eliminate all enemies in this vicinity and you're like holy shit so it's just a, a straight up action game at this point there, there's like the whole point of resident evil to me is to avoid using your ammo avoid eliminating all the enemies and that's just not the the there's nothing about that in resident evil 6 it's like dump all your clips and don't worry about it because by the next time you encounter a, a big moment like this with a bunch of enemies, you'll be loaded back up on all the ammunition you need to get through to the next encounter. And it's like, okay, so all the difficulty comes from the battle. None of the difficulty comes from the strategic planning at all. And it's like, once again, going back to RE2, RE3, and then how they figured out a way in that eight year process or whatever from RE6 to RE2 that they were able to incorporate those strategic elements back into the game while still giving you that over the shoulder style perspective that four introduced and then they improve on it, innovate on it and figure out a way to tie together how you can be more strategic, how you can Go in and try to avoid as many enemies as possible. Hoard up all your ammo for those big late stage encounters. And that's that just it all feels so much more true to the essence of the original games. And like, of course, I knew that, that going back to RE6, it was more of an action game. But it was crazy going back to it and playing through Leon's campaign because I always remember that being so much more grounded than the other ones in RE6. And immediately I'm like. Oh my God, this is straight up Gears of War. This is straight up 100% action. And so I, 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 I do want to go and play through all the other campaigns, but I'm like, oh my God, I, 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 if I thought that Leon's campaign back in the day was the most grounded out of all of them, 
what the hell am I in store for with these other, you know, uh, different campaigns here? So we'll see how all of that goes. But I, I will say I really do appreciate the, the cinematic touch to RE6 because regardless of how you feel about the game, you have to admit just in terms of presentation and production value, it's still the best that Ari has ever done with its cinematics. And it actually kind of makes the story feel valuable. Even if, you know, it's definitely unnecessary, convoluted, possibly when you're introducing in, you know, cloning characters and stuff like that, it almost starts to begin feeling like some, some Metal Gear-esque elements. But the story has always been somewhat convoluted, so it's not out of the ordinary for Resident Evil storylines to get a little bit messy, but I, I just appreciate diving into a Resident Evil story and feeling like, okay, we're really focusing and honing in on these characters and trying to tell you an important story re- with these characters. And I think there is something that they can take from that going forward. Like you still can make a true grounded survival horror experience. But also, you know, I'd be cool with seeing characters' story arcs explored a little bit more. Like, we love these characters, you know, people who have been with the series forever. We want to see more about Leon. We want to see more about Ada and Claire and Chris. And, like, it, it felt like RE6 was one of the first games that was really trying to focus on the the story with the cinematics a little bit more and then i actually do appreciate that element of re6 i i would like i said love to see that incorporated more with this throwback that they're doing to real survival horror but tying in a story with that with these characters that we love i'd definitely be down for that if that's like the direction that re9 went where we go to a leon campaign or we go and we just explore these characters that we we grew up with a little bit more and have a little bit more of a cinematic flair to it. I, I'm I'm just a story guy. I love stories and I, I love these characters. Grew up with these characters, so I I, I like seeing a, a little bit, you know, a little peek behind the curtains to who they are on a slightly deeper level. So I I, I appreciated that with RE6, and I also dove into a little bit of State of Decay 2. Shout out to my homie Dan Mall for recommending this. I, I I just wanted to check it out. He was super hot on it, and I just wanted to check it out to get a feel for it because I'd never played a State of Decay game before. And when the rumor, or I believe it's confirmed, that State of Decay 3 is going to be running on Unreal Engine 5, I just wanted to check out what the mechanics were like, what the gameplay was like, what how it was laid out for State of Decay 2 to kind of know what to expect going into 3 and to to have something to compare and contrast to. I didn't really have any intentions on finishing it because I know it's a bit bigger of a game and then there's just so much shit coming out in October that that I, you know, wanted to check out and stuff like Bayonetta 2 that I had to knock off the backlog before jumping into 3, but I just wanted to get a feel for it. And and I I love the systems that are in place with State of Decay. I I think that the actual management and and those elements are so so fun and going into town and you know overtaking a gas station or overtaking these little buildings and having your you know your people kind of run it from that point on and having like little safe spots that shit's really fun and going out into the world and scavenging and and trying to find resources and and you know just kind of hunting to to stay alive i i I like that aspect a lot and i think that there's something truly truly special that could be done here if the the production is ramped up a little bit the you know if it if it can have a little bit more of an you know just just next gen look and feel to it and hopefully with unreal engine 5 that the character models can be improved greatly hopefully with the coalition coming in they can can kind of fine tune that that gameplay experience a little bit more the gunplay can be tightened up a little bit more because i would say that that was holding me back from really getting into the game having somewhat not you know just subpar writing with the characters and really bad character models and visuals overall that that definitely pulls you out of it 
But that stuff I can overlook. It was just actually the the gameplay being a little bit sluggish. I was like, damn, you know, I, I think that there's something so, so special here with how deep these systems are. If somehow, and I know it's a serious feat, if it can ever be accomplished, but somehow if Unreal Engine 5 is being utilized at, at you know, its greatest potential and the coalition are coming in and, and helping them polish up the gameplay and the, the moment to moment a little bit there. I mean, Oh my God, state of decay three could take survival horror to an entirely new level because they have all the management stuff in place. They just need fine tuning a little bit on the, the, the gunplay. And then I think the writing, the voice acting, the character models, all that shit can probably pretty easily be improved upon with State of Decay 3. So I think that they have something special on their hands with Undead Labs. And, and I think we really could be in for State of Decay 3 being like the must play survival horror game of the, the ninth generation. If all those things come together, if they can keep the, the in-depth systems, but have a more kind of universally accessible or, or just tighter controlling gameplay experience. Really excited to see what they can end up cranking out over there at undead labs. And I'm also just kind of beginning Valkyrie Elysium digging it, digging it. The combat's really, really fun. More of a character action style of game, you know, in the vein of your FF seven remakes. I, I think that I, 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 the story's pretty predictable. I'm pretty sure I know exactly what's going to happen with the story there. Um, yeah, just, just, uh, I, I'm pretty, anybody who's playing the game, I think from the moment you booted up, you're pretty sure what twist they're going to take. Nothing wrong with that though. If, if you can tell a fun, predictable story, I don't mind that. You don't have to subvert my expectations to some great degree. Just give me something fun. And the combat loop is really fun, but I'll talk about that a little bit more in you know, weeks to come once I finish that and have played a couple more games to dive into here on what I'm playing. But that's it for this video. Let me know in the comments below what you have been playing as of late, and I will catch you all in the next one. Goodbye.